for having me. It's been fun. We got to run because a hearing is uh, starting live on Capitol Hill. Congressman Steve Horn, the Republican from California, has just gaveled in a hearing concerning a uh, General Accounting Office uh, report on the IRS. So here it is, live. The purposes that Congress intends. The Chief Financial Officers Act, enacted in 1990, represented the most comprehensive financial reform legislation of the last four decades. It established a leadership structure for federal financial management, including the appointment of chief financial officers in the 24 largest federal departments and independent agencies. In 1994, the Chief Financial Officers Act was amended to require agency-wide audited financial statements covering the agency's accounts and associated activities. March 1st is the due date for these statements, and it is appropriate that the first hearing we're conducting is on the Internal Revenue Service's financial statements. That will be since 1992 under a pilot program created by the Chief Financial Officers Act. Each year, these audits have shown significant weaknesses in the agency's financial management. Despite these weaknesses, the General Accounting Office, GAO, the Fiscal and Program Auditor for the Legislative Branch, gave the Internal Revenue Service a clean opinion in its 1997 financial statements. However, the auditors rendered this opinion only after the Internal Revenue Service spent several months and hundreds of thousands of taxpayer dollars to prepare the statements. This special effort was necessary because the Internal Revenue Service's accounting systems cannot provide basic accounting information in an efficient manner. On April 15th of last year, this subcommittee held an oversight hearing on the results of the Internal Revenue Service's 1997 audit. At that hearing, we learned that IRS estimated it could only recover about 13 percent of the $214 billion which taxpayers owed the federal government as of September 13th, 1997. Thirteen percent out of the amount that's owed. That's not very good. In fact, that's what started me several years ago with Mrs. Maloney, then the ranking Democrat, on the debt collection debt of uh, law of 1996. And of course, it does not apply to tax debt. It applies to all non-tax debt. And I do want to go in that with you in terms of the question period. We will learn today whether the agency has improved its ability to collect the amounts owed to the federal government. Last year's hearing also illustrated the need for better controls in handling cash payments at the Internal Revenue Service Centers. The 1997 audit provided the steps and direction Internal Revenue Service officials needed to follow in order to gain stronger financial control of this very important agency. We're here today to determine what progress has been made in meeting this sizable challenge. We'll hear testimony from representatives of the General Accounting Office, the Internal Revenue Service, and the Department of the Treasury. I'd like to think uh, that uh, we, we have an excellent group of witnesses, and I thank each of them for coming on such short notice. I look forward to your testimony, and I think you know the routine of this committee is we swear in all witnesses. So if you will rise, raise your right hand, and... Do you affirm the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? The clerk will note that all five witnesses affirmed. And we will now begin with the uh, first witness, and uh, that will be Mr. Turner. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Turner. Yes, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to admit at the outset of this hearing, Mr. Chairman, that I started working on my tax return last night, so I'm not a very, in a very good mood. Uh, I'm one of those uh, taxpayers who still uh, try to do my own return, and it becomes increasingly challenging uh, every year that passes. But it is good to, to be here this morning, and I appreciate the uh, witnesses uh, being here. I know it was very short notice uh, for you. Uh, this uh, hearing was only called last Friday, and so I know you were working uh, diligently to be prepared to be here today, and for that we are very uh, grateful. The scope of your operations are, of course, uh, very impressive. Um, on an annual basis, your agency processes tax returns from over 200 million taxpayers, reviews more than 2 billion documents, 
collects nearly $1.8 trillion in revenue and issues $151 billion in refunds, which we all hope we are able to have a part of, Mr. Chairman. But your annual operation is over $8 billion using uh, federal appropriations in that amount. The task that uh, you undertake, you do so with technology that I understand dates back to the 1970s. Uh, it's uh, very difficult, I'm sure, for the IRS to comply with modern financial management standards with technology that's that old. We know the IRS is in need of technological modernization, and to meet that demand, Commissioner Rosati is working towards modernizing the IRS, making it more consumer friendly. This makes good business sense, and it should increase the level and quality of services provided to each IRS customer. However, without significant modernization of its financial systems, the IRS will continue to lack the resources to assure financial discipline. The audit being released today underscores the reasons why the IRS needs to implement a technological modernization program as quickly as possible. As evidenced by the audit, we hear uh, about serious financial management deficiencies at the IRS. Although the year and information provided by the IRS regarding its annual $1.8 trillion in collections and its $151 billion in refunds is considered reliable, the General Accounting Office has identified several significant material weaknesses in the IRS financial systems, which prevent the IRS from complying with several financial management laws and standards, and therefore is in need of correction. The underlying financial problems with the IRS are chronic and longstanding and have spanned both Democrat and Republican administrations. The General Accounting Office documented many of the same financial problems in its first audit of the IRS financial statements for fiscal year 1992. And some of these problems go back, I understand, 17 years. However, this is no excuse. It's time for the IRS to implement modern financial systems that are capable of doing what the IRS expects the average American to do. Simply put, the IRS should be able to balance its checkbook, list its debts, and locate and identify its property and equipment. It is time for the agency to address some of the custodial concerns raised by the General Accounting Office, such as maintaining the security of the information submitted by taxpayers to the IRS and improving its ability to determine when it is owed money and when it is, has been paid. Many of the major financial problems that the General Accounting Office identifies would be resolved with more modern financial management systems. There are steps that the IRS can take now to improve its control over the cash and checks and taxpayer information that it receives. At this time, we're experiencing a new era of federal agency management. Agencies recognize that they must not only provide top quality government services, but also achieve them in a cost-effective manner. Agencies must develop financial management systems capable of tracking their ongoing financial condition assessing their financial vulnerabilities and determining the most cost-effective approach. We can anticipate criticism today of the IRS. However, in the spirit of improving the agency, I believe that the IRS will consider and respond to the legitimate concerns that are raised by the GOA audit. We have been told that the IRS plans to address its weaknesses through actions being implemented over the next few years. Given the importance of financial management requirements, we must not let the implementation of IRS corrective action fall through the cracks. The GAO report is something that the IRS should pay careful attention to. In closing, again, I thank the witnesses for being here today, for the efforts that you've made to prepare for this hearing, and it's my hope that the hearing will be productive uh, for the Internal Revenue Service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We thank you for that very fine statement. We now start with the representative of the General Accounting Office. Uh, Mr. Gregory D. Cutts is the Associate Director, Government-Wide Accounting and Financial Management of the Accounting and Information Management Division of the GAO. Mr. Cutts. Mr. Chairman and Congressman Turner, good morning. It is a pleasure to be here this morning to discuss the results of our audit of IRS's fiscal year 1998 financial statements, which is being released today in accordance with the March 1st statutory requirement. 
These financial statements are significant because they report the nearly $1.8 trillion in tax revenues, $151 billion in refunds, and $26 billion in net taxes receivable, which we'll refer to throughout this statement as IRS's custodial activities. These statements also show IRS's fiscal year 1998 appropriations of nearly $8 billion and the related activities, which we will refer to in this statement as IRS's administrative activities. With me today is Steve Sebastian, who was responsible for our work on the custodial activities, and Joan Hawkins, who was responsible for our work on the administrative activities. I would like to summarize my statement, but I would ask, Mr. Chairman, that my entire statement be made part of the record. It is, and uh, I'd say every witness, their documents are, and uh, appendices, everything, are put in the record when they start talking. But take your time okay. on this. I would also like to thank IRS senior management for the courtesy that they provided to me and the GAO staff throughout the country during this year's audit. They were very courteous in all respects. The bottom line of my testimony is that IRS continues to experience serious financial management and internal control problems. Many of these problems date back to our first audit in fiscal year 1992, as Congressman Turner noted. This morning, I will focus on three areas. First, the opinions on IRS's 1998 financial statements. Second, issues impacting those opinions. And third, issues impacting taxpayers and resulting in lost revenue to the federal government. The audit we performed of IRS's financial statements is similar in nature to audits done of all major publicly traded corporations in the United States. In addition, our audit included extensive testing of IRS's internal controls. My first point relates to our opinions on IRS's six main financial statements. And for reasons I will discuss in a moment, the opinions on these six financial statements vary. Our opinion on IRS's statement of custodial activities for this year is unqualified. This means that IRS's reported revenue of nearly $1.8 trillion and refunds of $151 billion are reliable. Our opinion on IRS's balance sheet is qualified. Although IRS's net tax receivable number of $26 billion is reliable, we were unable to determine the reliability of fund balance with Treasury and accounts payable. In addition, Another key balance sheet account, property and equipment, is likely materially understated. Our opinions on the other four main statements, the statements of net cost, changes in net position, budgetary resources, and financing, are disclaimers. This means that because of the problems we found with IRS's balance sheet, along with errors and weaknesses relating to non-payroll expenses, and budgetary accounts, we were unable to determine the accuracy of these financial statements. In addition, because of the severity of these problems, GAO was unable to determine whether IRS complied with the Anti-Deficiency Act, which restricts agencies from spending more than they are appropriated. Let me now move on to my second issue, which is the problems negatively impacting IRS opinions for 1998, which relate to their administrative activities. Some of the reasons for the opinion qualifications and the four disclaimers include, first, IRS did not reconcile the accounts related to its reported $1.8 billion fund balance with Treasury accounts. Think of this as not balancing your monthly or your checkbook to the monthly bank statement and at the same time having a record keeping system that was prone to error. Second, IRS was unable to properly safeguard or reliably report property and equipment. For example, when verifying the items in IRS's inventory, we noted a missing Chevy Blazer, laptop computer, and $300,000 printer. We also find items including a television, a fax machine, and a VCR that were not included in IRS's records. At one of IRS's field offices, 19 of 130 computer assets, over $50,000 each in cost, could not be located by IRS staff. IRS has itself reported property and equipment as a major internal control problem for 17 consecutive years. Third, 
IRS could not provide adequate support for accounts payable, non-payroll expenses, and budgetary data. Mr. Chairman, I have done dozens of audits in my career of corporations, state and local governments, and not-for-profit organizations, and IRS is the first entity that I've audited that could not provide a listing of accounts payable at year end. In addition to systems problems related to this issue, IRS has a suspense account with amounts that date back to 1989 appropriations. IRS has not investigated and resolved amounts in this account. My third and most important issue is that many of the problems we are reporting today have the potential to touch the everyday lives of taxpayers and result in lost revenue to the federal government. As I mentioned earlier, IRS was able to reliably report its custodial activities. However, this achievement required extensive, costly, and time-consuming ad hoc procedures to overcome chronic internal control and systems weaknesses. IRS cannot produce reliable custodial information on a routine basis. Despite the three reliable custodial financial statement, I'm sorry, but despite the reliable custodial information, we found three significant weaknesses that impact taxpayers and result in lost revenue for the federal government. First, we found systems problems relating to amounts due from taxpayers that have resulted in taxpayer burden and lost revenue. For example, we found that IRS was pursuing and collecting amounts from individuals whose taxes had already been paid. We also found instances where delays in recording transactions resulted in IRS missing opportunities to offset refunds paid to taxpayers against amounts that those taxpayers owed to the federal government. Next, we noted deficiencies in preventive controls over tax refunds that have permitted the disbursement of millions of dollars in fraudulent refunds. IRS has procedures in place to identify erroneous or fraudulent refunds. However, these controls occur after the refunds have been dispersed. Once a refund has been dispersed, IRS is compelled to expend its resources to recover it with dubious prospect of success. In addition, vulnerabilities in controls over cash, checks, and taxpayer data do not adequately protect the government and taxpayers from loss or inappropriate disclosure of sensitive data. For fiscal years 1997 and 1998, IRS reported over 150 actual or alleged employee thefts of receipts at IRS field offices and lockbox banks. These cases only represent IRS employees that were caught. The magnitude of thefts not identified by IRS is unknown. The vulnerabilities we noted include, but are not limited to, IRS not receiving results of background checks on new employees until well after they were placed in positions to handle tax receipts and taxpayer data. 15% of thefts of taxpayer receipts committed at IRS service centers in recent years were by individuals who had previous arrest records that were not identified prior to their employment. In addition, we observed the use of single, unarmed couriers in ordinary civilian vehicles, including in one instance, a bicycle, to transport hundreds of millions in taxpayer receipts to the bank. At the service center that Mr. Sebastian and I visited, the courier left over $200 million of endorsed taxpayer checks with sensitive data in a Ford Explorer that was unlocked with the windows down while he returned to the service center. Theft of taxpayer checks and other data can result in access to bank accounts and, ident and identity fraud, which can create significant taxpayer burden. One other matter that you mentioned in your opening statement, Mr. Chairman, of great importance to the federal government is the collectability of IRS's unpaid assessments. The poster board to my right and the last page of my written statement show the components of IRS's $222 billion of unpaid assessments at September 30, 1998. Please note that based on a statistical projection done jointly 
by GAO and the IRS that $26 billion, or only 11 percent, of IRS unpaid assessments will ultimately be collected. In summary, IRS cannot do many of the basic accounting and record-keeping tasks that it expects American taxpayers to do. And several of the problems I discussed have resulted in unnecessary taxpayer burden and losses to the federal government. We agree with the IRS that this situation is not acceptable. The problems I have described this morning are chronic in nature and despite past attempts and corrective action plans by IRS, have not yet been successfully resolved. Some of these problems can be resolved quickly with improvements in basic internal controls. However, for other problems, tax system modernization will need to be part of a longer-term solution. We have provided IRS with a series of recommendations to resolve these weaknesses. The agency agrees with the facts discussed in our report and has reacted in a very constructive manner. In its written response to our report, IRS committed to executing the changes necessary to improve its operations. We are committed to working with the IRS in fiscal year 1999 and future years to develop lasting solutions to these pervasive problems. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my testimony. My colleagues and I would be happy to respond to any questions. Well, we thank you uh, for that very succinct statement of your testimony. Uh, I take it at this point neither of your colleagues have anything else to add to the presentation. We, we can hold that till. All right. We'll uh, wait on the questioning till we have everybody have a chance to get their statement in. So uh, let us go then to the next witness, which is Ms. Donna Cunningham, Chief Financial Officer of the Internal Revenue Service. Mr. Chairman and Mr. Turner, I thank you for this opportunity to testify on the GAO report. I must sadly state that the findings contained in this report have merit, and I'm deeply disappointed that we failed to meet our obligations. While many of these problems, as you've heard repeatedly, are not new and require long-term solutions, the GAO has also outlined several new issues that we need to address. The GAO correctly raised significant concerns and identified substantial weaknesses and deficiencies that prevented the IRS from reliably reporting on several of its required principal financial statements in the time frame allowed. This is unacceptable to the IRS, to the Congress, and to the taxpayers that we serve. We must first acknowledge and understand how and why we failed. Secondly, we need to create and implement, and are in the process of doing so, short and long-term plans that will address the challenges raised. And thirdly, we need to follow up with these plans with an ongoing commitment from the highest level of IRS management. I want to stress too, Mr. Chairman, that this will not be a plan developed behind closed doors, but will be an open and shared enterprise on behalf of America's taxpayers. We are developing it with the assistance from OMB, the Treasury Department and their Inspector General, with outside contractors, and with the assistance of the GAO. I plan to present it to you uh, in the final draft and uh, submit it to you and to the subcommittee to seek your comments to ensure that you agree with our approach. We will welcome any suggestions you have, and we will report to you regularly on our progress. Mr. Chairman, I became the Chief Financial Officer at the Internal Revenue Service on August 16th of 1998. During the six months that I've held this position, our vulnerabilities became apparent, particularly apparent in the loss of several qualified individuals who previously managed the preparation of our administrative financial statements. Unfortunately, we did not replace them in time. The results of this personnel shortfall have become painfully obvious and the consequences unacceptable. We have also learned the painful lesson that solutions left unattended quickly become problems again. We must follow through on problems. We need to repeatedly review our performance and build upon our successes while learning about our failures. In the short term, we are addressing many of the problems raised by the GAO. In the past month, I have hired five new professional employees to fill key slots on the administrative side and we are contracting with two of the large public accounting firms to assist us in providing the human resources and the expertise that we must have to meet the needs identified in the GAO report. 
Although we were pleased to obtain an unqualified opinion on our $1.8 trillion custodial financial statements, we do agree with the GAO that it was a result of extensive workaround procedures. We recognize these systems deficiencies and we have ongoing initiatives aimed at correcting these problems in both the short and the long term. Mr. Chairman, there will be noticeable improvements in our financial statements, but I need to emphasize that these are nevertheless short-term fixes with the inherent deficiencies that go along with them. Our system solutions will take several years to put into effect. In the long term, the inadequacies of our financial reporting systems must be addressed through our broader efforts under Commissioner Rosati to modernize both the systems and the structure of the IRS as mandated by the IRS Restructuring and Reform Act of 1998. But like our troubled financial statements, most solutions, as I said previously, will require years to plan and to implement. One key to better financial management at the IRS is improved technology. The IRS must replace nearly its entire inventory of computer applications and convert its data on every taxpayer to new systems. This must be accomplished in conjunction with redesigned business practices as part of our overall modernization program at the same time while we continue to provide service to taxpayers and to respond to ongoing tax law and other changes. This is vast, complex, and a risky undertaking that will require many years to accomplish. Mr. Chairman, in conclusion, I would again like to thank this committee for providing us with this opportunity to review and acknowledge the issues set forth in, G in the GAO's report and to discuss with you the IRS's plans to address these serious shortcomings. The IRS must work every day to earn the trust of the American public. To do that, I pledge to you today that we will continue to improve our financial reporting system and modernize so that the IRS can provide America's taxpayers top quality service for the decades to come. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Our, uh Last witness is Mr. Stephen App, the Deputy Chief Financial Officer of the Department of the Treasury. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Turner, good morning. Uh, thanks for inviting me here again today to discuss financial management in the Department of Treasury and in the Internal Revenue Service. It was two and a half years ago in September of 96 that I last appeared before the committee on the eve of the first required agency-wide financial statements being prepared by Treasury and by other agencies. Today, I would like to limit my oral remarks to just three points submitted in my written testimony. First, in terms of departmental oversight, we are disappointed in the fiscal 98 audit results due to the IRS problems, uh, even though we are expected to receive an overall qualified opinion on Treasury statements for the second year in a row. Frankly, based on the success of 97, with a clean opinion at IRS, one qualification, and a March 30 delivery date, we were optimistic that 98 would be our breakthrough year in terms of a quality, clean opinion for the Treasury Department. In late January 99, when it became apparent that the General Accounting Office identified problems in the IRS that would result in less than desirable audit, we immediately contacted the Office of Management and Budget GAO, IRS, to discuss what could and should be done for the 98 audit. Extend the audit for 98 in hopes of getting better results or stop the audit and focus on the future. The Department and IRS, supported by GAO and OMB, chose to focus on the future, developing an action plan for fiscal 99 for the financial statement and audit process. The Department is fully cognizant that IRS is the key issue for 99 financial statements. And on behalf of the Assistant Secretary for Management and CFO, I can assure you that we are using the full weight of our office to help ensure better results for 99. In short, we are committing that the fiscal year 99 reporting initiative will be better focused by IRS and the Department, that our partnership with GAO will continue to improve, and that we will do everything within our power to allow GAO to begin as early as possible with the interim audit work. The second area I'd like to mention is regarding the risk factors that we had identified for the IRS audit. One of those risk factors in the administrative statements involves three new statements that all agencies are facing, a statement of net cost, a statement of financing, and a statement of budgetary resources as well as certain balance sheet items like property, plant, and equipment that deal with capitalization thresholds. In fairness to the IRS, 
these problematic issues are not restricted to them alone, but are government-wide issues as well. And while many of Treasury's bureaus successfully negotiated these issues, I think you will find in future hearings with other agencies that these also pose a problem for them. Finally, in terms of progress, while we freely acknowledge the financial statement preparation problems at the IRS and its significant impact on the Department, we have made considerable progress over the past three required audit cycles, both in terms of quality of results and in terms of timeliness of completion. In 96, uh, moving from a disclaimer on our Treasury-wide statements to 97 with a qualified opinion and again for 98 with increasing a convergence on the March 1st delivery date from April 30th to March 30th to mid-March this year. Uh, in addition, as was previously mentioned, Treasury again received unqualified opinions in 98 on its primary government-wide functions, collecting revenue, managing the public debt. Uh, GAO is rendering unqualified opinions on the IRS revenue collection of $1.8 trillion and Bureau of Public Debt's federal debt of $5.5 trillion. With the exception of the IRS administrative statements, all other Treasury audited bureaus and entities this year are also receiving clean audit opinions, including our other revenue bureaus, Customs and ATF, which will have clean audit opinions for three years in a row, as well as with the other parts of Treasury. I'd like to conclude by emphasizing again that our renewed focus on the IRS administrative accounts and action plan for 99, coupled with the demonstrated three-year track record of converging on a clean opinion by March 1st, uh, makes the CFO and myself remain optimistic and committed to making 99 our breakthrough year for both fronts. I would be pleased to answer any questions. That ends my prepared remarks. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Let me start with uh, five minutes. Mr. Turner and I are going to alternate every five minutes, probably to rest our throats with what's diseased in this city. Uh, let me start in with the obvious one, because it just sort of glaringly shows up in the property management, and that's the printer. I take it it was worth 300000 Is that correct, Mr. Coots? According to IRS's records, yes. Yeah, well, how big was a printer like this? I'm just curious it, uh, how you get that out of an office and down through the elevator and all the rest of it. I mean, how big was this thing? Do we know? Let me defer to Ms. Hawkins on s more specifics if she has them. You're the printer chaser, then. <laughs> has anybody ever found it, by the way? In the case of the printer, um, it was disposed of. We w did receive something saying it was disposed of in, in 1994. So we haven't seen it, so we don't know what it looks like. Uh, there was just um, uh, not posting the disposal on the record. So even though they could p sh give us a document saying it had been disposed of in 1994, it was still being counted as one of the uh, assets on their records. Well, when you say disposed, I'm just not clear on what that means. Does that mean somebody walked out with it and they wrote it off like they've written off uh, the uh, receivables and uh, write-offs of $119 billion? I, mean, I, I think in this case it probably means they turned it over to another agency such as the General Services Administration for disposal. Uh, according to proper procedures, where they what they failed to do was to record that um, disposal. Okay, so nobody took it then, is that No, correct? I don't think anyone took that printer. So they were turning it in for a new one? Uh, they were turning it in because they no longer needed it. I assume they probably also got a new one. Because we went through this last year with the Pentagon in terms of where are their ships and where is their missiles and so forth. And it just seems to me, do, do the IRS offices have security uh, from, say, the General Services Protective Service? Yes, or do, do you have, have your own? We do you have your own people, or do you use GSAs? I, we do have our own people uh, who are um, certified enforcement are officials. Armed? Yes, they are. They are. And uh, do, are they there at night when different shifts are coming on and off? Yes, sir, they are. And uh, would they uh, mark down something if somebody's walking through the door with a personal computer? Yes, sir. Or a would. printer, as the case may be. I believe the answer to that is an unqualified yes. So 
of what does GAO say? Did you look at their security system on how things can go out the back door? I mean, every firm in America has that problem, so there are ways to solve it. Whether it relates to security or record keeping at this point, we're unclear. We did look at their records. We did inventories from the records to the floor and from the floor to the records, and we found errors in both ways. We aren't sure exactly what the issue is. They do take your inventories periodically of these assets and adjust their records for the inventories. But whether the physical security relates to actual security as you're describing it, we're not sure at this point. Do they have a standard time in which they take inventory, or is it a, a unstandard time in the sense that you surprise everybody and say, where's the typewriters, where's the personal computers, where are anything of much value? How does IRS deal with that? And who does it? Does some outside firm come in, or does IRS do it? We believe that they take cycle inventories, so uh, I think they try to hit everything once a year, would be my understanding. Okay, Across so the country. At the same time? No. Cy cyclically, at different uh, places, okay. get an inventory at a different point in time. What, did you ever find the Chevy Blazer? Yes, sir. Who had that one? Uh, the Chevy Blazer highlights two problems we have with our fixed asset inventory records. One is that we have two systems we use that are not integrated, do not talk to each other. We also have employees who sometimes are less diligent than they should be about following procedures that have been established. With regard to the Chevy Blazer, it was a leased vehicle. It had been returned to the uh, company that owned it, I think a month or so before the inventory was uh, to take place, where we failed was well, two places. We did not remove it from the inventory listing as we should have. And secondly, we were not able to account for it in a timely manner when GAO first raised the issue. We should be able to do both of those, and we failed. Now, that was 17 years ago, was it, in terms of inventory? Or how long has this problem been out there and not addressed? It has been there for a period of time, and we do take a lot of uh, manual activities that we try to bridge the gap between the two systems. I haven't been here long enough. I don't know if somebody can answer that for me. How long? I guess it's just been an ongoing problem, sir. Well, I realize IRS has uh, downsized about 6,000 employees since 1993. I think there's 102,000 employees now. That's accurate. What is needed in terms of having a, an effective and efficient accounting service and an inventory service? Our basic problems stem to our systems. We do not have the types of systems we need that talk to each other, that are up-to-date, state-of-the-art, integrated systems that will readily post to our general ledger system. As you are aware, I know we are doing a number of things on trying to fix that. I do have Paul Cosgrave, who is our chief information officer, and if you would allow me, I'd like him to tell you a little bit about what we are doing with the systems, including the financial systems. Uh, fine, I'll tell you, let's do it on my round. I want to have Mr. Turner uh, right now, and then we'll get back to that. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to address the uh, issue of refunds a little bit with you. And I guess I need to ask the General Accounting Office first to uh, address the problem of refunds. Uh, you've identified uh, several problems in that area. And I guess first, if you could just give us an estimate of the amount inappropriately paid out in refunds in the last year. And if you will, also maybe identify what type of refunds we're talking about in those improper refunds. And also, I noticed last year there was some uh, testimony uh, from Ms. Cunningham's predecessor about several steps that the IRS was taking uh, to try to correct the problems of uh, improper refunds. And I would like to ask the General Accounting Office if you have noted any improvements as a result uh, of the efforts that were testified to uh, a year ago by Ms. Cunningham's uh, predecessor. 
Congressman Turner, we have seen some improvements, and I will defer to Mr. Sebastian to give you some details on the improvements and specifically the first question you had asked about. I will mention that the actual amount of fraudulent or inappropriate refunds dispersed is unknown. There is no way to determine for sure what that number is, but there is a known number that's reported by the IRS, and I'll defer to Mr. Sebastian for that. Yes, uh, the IRS has actually identified $17 million in fraudulent refunds that were dispersed in the first nine months of calendar year 1998. Uh, in addition, the IRS had actually stopped the disbursement of inappropriate refunds amounting to $65 million over that same time period. Uh, as, as Mr. Coots points out, the exact number of or exact amount of inappropriate refunds dispersed is unknown, and it is in fact one of the issues that we have raised with the IRS uh, dating back to our fiscal year 1997 audit when we uh, re recommended that the IRS consider conducting a comprehensive cost-benefit study to determine whether it was cost beneficial to add additional preventive controls to the upfront processing of tax returns prior to the issuance or disbursement of, of refunds. To date, we have seen some estimates of the upfront additional cost associated with adding additional preventive controls, such as verifying information from the tax returns to certain third-party information, such as wage and, and tax statements. Uh, however, what we have, have yet to see uh, is the actual estimate, an actual estimate of the dollar value of ref inappropriate refunds that are dispersed on a yearly basis, as well as the additional cost associated with identifying and then pursuing collections on those refunds. Um, so ag again, there is, no, there is no dollar value out here that we could point to that would give you the magnitude of, of this problem. Now, the IRS uh, has made some improvements. Um, as, as I pointed out a few moments ago, uh, the IRS was able to identify and, and stop the disbursement of $65 million in uh, potential fraudulent uh, claims. In addition, with respect to their earned income tax credit program, the IRS examined roughly 290,000 tax returns uh, claiming EITC uh, claims. Uh, the dollar value associated with those EITC claims amounted to about $662 million. The IRS determined that roughly 68 percent of that dollar value, or $448 million, uh, were found to be not valid, and those amounts were not dispersed. So there are some additional procedures that are in place uh, that, that are flagging and identifying some of these potentially uh, fraudulent or erroneous returns. So I, do I understand you, you said the IRS examined 290,000 earned income tax credit claims. Yes. And out of those, they found 448 million of them to be uh, improper? The, the dollar value associated with the claim of 442 million out of a total of 668 million in EITC claims associated with those 290 tax returns. Uh, Congressman Turner, let me mention on that that I think that those were actual claims that were flagged for having some characteristics that were unusual. So that is not a representative percentage of probably the earned income tax credit claims that are invalid. It's the percentage of those that look suspicious that were invalid. That's an important distinction here. Just to give me a little perspective here, how many earned income tax credit claims do we have every year? Well, in total, in fiscal year 1998, the IRS processed earned income tax credit claims amounting to $29 billion, of which $23 billion uh, actually resulted in refunds. The other $6 billion resulted in a reduction to the tax liability. So the percentage that were examined, that 290000 is really a very small portion of the earned income tax credit that's, claims. That's that's correct. But they do represent a group that was identified as having potential problems. So it's not fair to say 68 percent of all That's EITC claims are probably fraudulent. That's correct. That would be a... It seems to me that, um, as I recall, doesn't the law require these refunds or all refunds to be made within 45 days? 
Yes, it does, and, and, and that is a problem, a, a perplexing situation the IRS finds itself in. Uh, they are required to uh, process tax returns involving refunds and issue the refunds within 45 days. Um, any, any refunds issued beyond that date uh, would include uh, interest payments to the, to the taxpayer. And you say there's really been no determination as to whether or not it's cost effective to add additional staff at IRS to be sure we're not refunding these billions of dollars in inappropriate refunds? There is no comprehensive study that we've seen at this time. We have seen initial estimates of the additional upfront cost in terms of, of staff days in validating certain information on the tax returns with other third-party information prior to dispersing the refunds. What we haven't seen is the back-end savings associated with preventing disbursements of inappropriate refunds and then the additional cost associated with trying to recover those inappropriate disbursements. I, I want to suggest something here that, that obviously may not be consistent with what you just shared with me, but it seems to me that if we've got fraud going on in the Internal Revenue Service, if there are people who are claiming refunds to which they're not entitled, that we have an obligation to uphold the law and to be sure that's not happening, even if it's not cost effective. And it disturbs me somewhat to think that those of us who have fought very hard to be sure that we have a tax system that has the trust and confidence of the American people would be told that we're not going to collect those taxes and we're not going to prevent improper refunds unless it's cost effective. I think the American people who are paying their taxes are entitled to know that everyone is paying what they properly owe and no one's getting anything back that they're not due. And I, I really think that uh, the service needs to take a, a new look if that is the philosophy of the Internal Revenue Service as you've shared it here today. Let me pursue the earned income tax credit. I'd like to know, does the IRS and the Treasury have a view on that, and how, what do they think can be done in a reasonable way to get at the fraud that clearly exists in the program? Everybody that writes about it says, gee, there's great fraud here. Now, the fact that we took millions off the tax rolls in the 1986 Act it just seems to me, how do we differentiate between those we simply took off the tax rolls and, in a sense, this is a welfare system, and that's what it was designed to be. I think this was a Nixon administration creation, wasn't it? Uh, if I might, Mr. Horn, I would like to defer to our Chief Operations Officer, John Dalrymple, who can uh, share his experience on the EITC with you. Okay. We're going to have to swear him in. Uh, if you want to raise your hand. You affirm that the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. The clerk will note the witness has affirmed it. <clears throat> with, with regard to uh, EITC, actually, we, we've tried to take sort of a two-pronged approach here. W one is to uh, eliminate as much of the overclaim rate as possible. On the, on the other hand, make sure that all the people who are eligible for EITC actually claim it, because there's, we really have a problem on both ends of that. <clears throat> but just to give you some numbers, um, in 1998, uh, we actually did 800,000 examinations on pre-refund returns. Now, what that means is that before the refund went out, we actually examined those tax returns. We also did 600,000, <clears throat> I'm sorry, math errors, which Congress gave us the authority to treat these as math errors. Again, those are pre-refund. Together, uh, we, we believe we stopped somewhere around $977 million uh, <clears throat> going out in, in overclaims that would have gone to folks that shouldn't have got them in uh, 1998. So um, this is actually a payoff for the, uh, the investment that the Congress made in this program uh, two years ago. Uh, 1998 was the first year that we actually uh, spent, I, I believe, $138 million to try to uh, deal with this issue. On the other hand, we um, also sent out uh, several million uh, notifications to those people who we, who we had fa fairly good uh, knowledge should have been claiming or could have been claiming this credit and didn't. And in addition to that, we, uh, we, had, we had several 
uh, programs this last year that we uh, try to take an alternative approach to these folks as opposed to the examination routine um, or, or um, any other sort of enforcement activity. We actually identified some people who we thought uh, may have uh, been involved in uh, using someone else's social security number. In other words, they were used more than once, a duplicate uh, identification number. And we sent out um, about 300,000 of those notices. <clears throat> and we got very good compliance of people actually going back and amending their returns, and then in the, in the subsequent year this year, not claiming that, um, that uh, dependent that they shouldn't have. Many of these instances were, uh, were spouses who were separated, et cetera, and, and really didn't know who was claiming uh, the child. So uh, and in addition, uh, we've done a substantial amount of outreach around this program this year. This law is not a simple uh, piece of legislation, the uh, EITC credit, in terms of determining whether or not you qualify or not. So we've done quite a bit ar around this in terms of outreach to make sure people understand when and when they do not qualify for this, uh, this credit. What's the range of payments that one can get under the earned income tax credit? Does, what's the scale? I think the maximum you could probably get is somewhere around three thousand uh, dollars. The lowest range, I believe, is uh, down to several hundred dollars. Uh, I, I could get that though for you for the record. Could you, uh, without objection, it'll be in the record at this point. Obviously, we want to know the how the formula works and well, how many people access the formula at one end as opposed to the other end. Mr. Chairman, that's yeah. consistent with what we saw in our financial audit and the sample items from the 1998 audit. I, I think you, does GAO have anything else to comment on this particular program? No, but the size of the EITC refunds you're talking about or actual claims is consistent with what Mr. Dalrymple said. Any other comments you want to make on that? Uh, I, the only other thing I would say is to um, sort of buttress what the GAO said about our, uh, our, our whole strategy around refund um, fraud is to put a, a system up front and uh, several years ago we contracted with a, uh, a fairly uh, substantial vendor to try to, to try to put up on our upfront systems an electronic fraud detection system. And we've been uh, enhancing that each, each uh, year. We have contracted with, um, uh, with Malcolm Sparrow to come in and review that, uh, that system, and he's given us some advice on how uh, we might make it better, et cetera. So we agree with the GAO that the real crux here is to have a system on the front end that uh, would, um, over time, uh, be smart enough, intelligent enough to actually see trends, et cetera. I think the other point I would make is that our questionable refund detection teams, uh, we have uh, over 500 employees now uh, employed in, in that system, and they're literally looking for schemes. And just this year, for example, we, we, uh, we found a scheme where uh, Promoters were, were uh, telling taxpayers to go out and, and get all of their, claim all of their Social Security payments that they've ever made back against a refund this year. And so far, we've stopped over $50 million in refunds on that scheme alone just in this filing season. So th the fact is we are catching schemes. Now, who's investigating that? Is the FBI? Our, our, our Criminal Investigation Division is investigating that. And what's happening as a result well, of those a, it's investigations? A, it's, a, we're, it's just unfolding as we speak, Mr. Horn. Well, how extensive do you think it is? Well, we're trying to find that out right now. Mm -hmm. We found the scheme in the centers, we stopped the refunds, and now we're trying to go back up the, uh, the trail to... Uh, uh, Was it in promoters. one area? No, it's, uh, it's wider than that, sir. What do you think caused it? I mean, is there somebody that's uh, scamming it nationwide? I, I would say that that would be my initial reaction, but as, again, I don't have enough data to tell you that for sure. Okay, well, keep us uh, informed on that one. I will. Uh, Mr. Turner? I'm not sure I understood the scheme that you're now investigating. Explain what's happening. <coughs> well, in detail, uh, look at my notes to make sure that I give it to you uh, exactly correctly. It's a, uh, it's a scheme in which individual taxpayers file a fraudulent return complaint uh, claiming significant refunds. The, they're being told that for a paperwork fee of about $100, they can receive a refund of all of their Social Security taxes withheld during their lifetime. So they're being directed to obtain a printout from the Social Security Administration of their lifetime Social Security earnings for themselves and their spouses. 
then fraudulent returns are then filed, which computes a refund based on the current tax rate during the times of the lifetime earnings. And basically, you know, it's preying on people's lack of knowledge of the Social Security system and the tax laws. So you, you're saying that, that someone is out there telling folks to claim a refund of all the Social Security contributions they've made during their lifetime? That's right. And they're actually filing that kind of return and they're getting a refund? They're not getting a refund. We've been stopping the refunds, but they are filing the, uh, the returns. Well, that is and you're an right. unusual someone scheme. Is, someone is promoting it, Mr. Turnier. It's hard to imagine that anyone would think that that is possible, but uh, perhaps somebody's doing a pretty good sales job and they're being compensated for advising folks to, to do this. Is that that, that's the information I have with me today. Uh, another area uh, that's a problem, as I understand it, in refunds is that taxpayers are getting refunds when they may owe the federal government money in either taxes or some other venue. Uh, is, is that a, a finding of the General Accounting Office, and what is the extent of that particular problem? We found that this year in our, our sample results where there was uh, several instances in the unpaid assessment sample. I'll defer to Mr. Sebastian to give you the details of that, but yes, we did find that. Yeah, I cannot give you the specific number of cases. We did look at a total of 700 unpaid assessment sample items, uh, but the instances that we did identify were simply those where actual assessments, i.e. additional tax liabilities, had not posted to IRS's systems prior to the disbursement of a refund. Uh, had those assessments posted on a timely basis and been on the books, the IRS would have been able to offset or retain the refund to pay down the additional tax liability that should have been on the books. You correct me if I'm wrong, but it appears to me that because the law requires a refund to be made by the IRS within 45 days, that all that's going on is the IRS is sending out the refund within 45 days and there's not much else happening before the refund goes out. Am I misinformed here or is that actually what's taking place? Well, again, in, in, in the cases that we looked at, these were assessments that should have been posted and on the books at the time the refund, uh, uh, the return with the refund claim had been filed. So had they been on the books at that point in time, the IRS would have been would able have to offset. It. Right. There's no way that they would have known that these assessments were there because they, some of the assessment delays are several years in some instances, we found. But again, IRS is in a difficult position with the 45 days and the timing of processing these returns, especially during the peak season. You're getting, I, I will let them tell you how many, but millions of pieces of mail a day in the April filing season. So they are under a lot of pressure to get the refunds out. I'm sure you've probably gotten some calls from your constituents on where are their refund checks, or I know other members probably have at least, and uh, they're in a difficult position. It doesn't excuse what's happening, but it is a tough position. It, it just seems to me that, that we, we have a, a problem that's brought about by the 45-day time limit that's either got to be remedied by extending the time for a refund, which the taxpayers wouldn't like, right. or staffing at a level that will allow us to recover uh, these fraudulent refunds. Right. One of the long-term solutions that IRS is looking at is the electronic matching up front, and this, I believe, is part of their tax system modernization program. And I don't know if they have any comment on that. Uh, he is correct in that, and if I may, I would like to ask Paul Cosgrave, our CIO, to explain to you what we are doing in that area. No, he's not been sworn in. Next time, let us, if you've got 25 assistants with you, let us uh, swear them all in. Raise your right hand. I swear the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. The clerk will note the witness has affirmed it. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Chairman Horn and Mr. Turner, for allowing me to speak on this issue. Uh, First of all, uh, I think it has been stated, the, the age of the IRS systems is, is, in, is, is correct, quite old. Uh, I believe you referred to them dating back to the 70s. In fact, some of them date back to the 60s. Uh, and that is at the root cause of a lot of these problems. However, let me uh, try to correct a few things. Uh, first of all, 
as it relates to uh, refund checking. Uh, we do have a process in place that uh, goes against a debtor uh, file uh, that is not just IRS debtor file, but debtor file to the government as a whole. And uh, most refunds are run up against that uh, file before, in fact, they are, they are issued. So it's not, uh, as you stated, it's not just that these refunds are being, being issued without any checking. There is, in fact, a check against that. If, now, I, if I might, just because I wanted to pursue this area, if I could refine it a little, what is the authority of Treasury and, I, and or IRS in terms of checking other government debts that that person might have uh, incurred and have they uh, replaced them. Is there a law that permits you to do that? Uh, yes, there is. I can't give you the specifics of it, but I, I will say that it exactly uh, follows the process that you just described. And in fact, this year, uh, with this filing season, we actually uh, transferred the, uh, that function over to FMS, uh, who now performs that. Um, across all the uh, government. We, did, we performed it ourselves across all the government, but the improved process now is where FMS is doing that. Well, I, I'm all for you, but because when our Debt Collection Act of 1996 became law, it applied only to non-tax areas. So if you're collecting it, God bless you as far as I'm concerned, because I was outraged by the millions that were going under the table and out, and nobody ever had to pay around here. Uh, in 98, we offset 2.7 million returns through, through, this, through this vehicle. So, um, And that boiled down to what? I'm looking at that chart, and if we can just go over it again, you've got uh, well, they, the uh, taxes receivable collectible, 26 billion is the estimate. Taxes receivable uncollectible is 55 billion. The, Compliance assessments at 22, but the one that has always annoyed me, and that's what led to the 96 Act, write-offs of $119 billion. And if I was listening to this or reading about it in the paper, I'd say, gee, all you got to do is wait them out, and pretty soon they'll just forget about me. Now, that's sort of amazing, because I wouldn't think anybody would forget about the IRS, but... Uh, uh, your bulldog appearance does not necessarily say that they're worried because these people just sit there. And I'd love to know the makeup from both GAO and the IRS as to these write-offs of $119 billion. I realize people go into bankruptcy and all that. But if it's a pattern in practice, I think we ought to amend the bankruptcy law or something and get some of that money back for the taxpayers when the rest of us are paying the bills. To the extent that refunds have been offset, the amounts would no longer be included in this unpaid assessment inventory. And I don't know what the actual dollars are. I believe over a billion dollars is associated with the 2.7 million items that Mr. Cosgrave mentioned. But with, with respect to the write-offs, those are primarily failed SNLs, RTC entities, and defunct corporations that date back in some instances to the 70s. Uh, there is no hope of collection. Also, uh, individuals that are in prison for life sentences with no assets or uh, persons that have passed away that have no estate are included in that amount. The reason it gets to be so large is that IRS is required to keep these amounts on its books for 10 years or more if you go through a bankruptcy court, etc. So each of those years that goes by, you have the accrual of a lot of interest. Uh, for example, the SNLs and, and those types of entities, uh, I don't know, I, do you have the numbers, Steve? Uh, the, the actual amount of those initial assessments was maybe 5 or 10 billion, but it's going to grow to 40 or 50 billion by the end of the statute period. In other the words, they're interest. applying the interest and putting that into the write-off? That's correct. Uh, there's and interest at the in end of 10 years, it just goes away? Right. It comes off of the books completely. So most of the items in the write-off category are very old. Well, but the, you know, they can't forever blame the SNLs. When, when was the peak of the SNL robbery against the American taxpayers? Uh, you were looking at uh, large SNL and, and then bank failures from the period of about 1984, 1985 uh, through 1991. And, well, uh, okay, so it's 1995, passed three or four years ago. Is this a sort of another year 2000 problem? They're all going to explode at once? 
Well, or come back to life at once and to, to cheat you and us. To the to the extent they're not in the in the midst of bankruptcy proceedings, what should end up happening uh, after that 10-year period is the uh, the balance of the taxes receivable and all associated uh, penalties and interest will come off the books. Mm -hmm. So it could be a significant write-off of the write-offs. Does my colleague want to pursue anything on this? Well, I certainly share your concern, Mr. Chairman. Um, it, it, it disturbs me when we try to analyze the actions that the IRS has taken to improve their, their financial management practices that, uh, that we may not be seeing the emphasis placed where I really believe the emphasis should be placed, and that is on building a credible tax system that has the confidence of the American people. Uh, and as I mentioned in my remarks earlier, uh, there are certain things that seem to me that must be done to be sure that we have a tax system we can all be confident in and believe that we're all paying our fair share. And in those areas, if the IRS would simply try to identify the, the credibility areas and move aggressively in those areas, I think we at least might have a tax code that might you know, survive for a few more years. As we all know, the tax code is under an increasing stress. There are those who would like to simply abolish the progressive income tax, which has served us for many, many years. And I think those who would like to accomplish that can certainly cite some good examples that we've heard here today of what's wrong with the federal income tax system as we know it. And I think we've got an obligation to make some changes. And I think the Internal Revenue Service has an obligation to this Congress when we find areas where there's abuse and fraud. You know, if 45 days is not working, uh, maybe we need to talk about refunding half of the taxpayers' uh, money uh, at 45 days and the other half at, at uh, 90, something, to allow this tax system to work fairly and credibly. If we keep going down this road, I'm really concerned that we're not going to have a system that uh, is going to be able to survive. Uh, one other problem that was mentioned uh, in the uh, testimony that I, I have a hard time understanding, and that is why we can't reconcile our trust fund collections that are received by the IRS with what the, the Treasury has. I, and that seems to me to be a, a simple accounting problem. I understand you, you accomplish that at the end of the year. Um, by some ad hoc methodology, but it's beyond me as to why we can't keep up with what's supposed to be in the trust funds uh, between the IRS and the Treasury Department. Could you expand on that just a little bit from the perspective of the General Accounting Office? Mr. Turner, can I first address your first point, sure. if I may? Uh, I think, as you're well aware, uh, the IRS is in the midst of a transformation of significant... Uh, we have a new commissioner, um, Commissioner brought on, uh, uh, Ms. Cunningham as new chief financial officer and myself as new chief information officer all within the past year. Um, we are committed to restructuring the organization uh, in a great way. Uh, we're changing the organization, as you know, to align ourselves with the taxpayers. Uh, that's a major effort that's going on. We're developing new measures of performance for the, uh, for the uh, service, which we have a new mission statement, which clearly recognizes the need to provide service to each taxpayer, while at the same time providing fairness to all the point you raised, raised earlier. Um, we're revamping business processes and, and we're modernizing the technology. All of these things are occurring simultaneously and um, because of the age and, and the uh, serious um, inadequacies in many of the base systems are requiring an awful lot of work and aren't going to happen overnight. But I, I just want to assure you that the commissioner and uh, all his uh, direct reports are absolutely committed um, to, to what you've laid out in terms of uh, generally uh, supporting the, the system that we have in place. And I think some of the loopholes that, that have been brought up here are, are simply that. They're, they're, they're weaknesses in the system that can be corrected. Uh, but they're not 
overall massive failure of the system. I, th I think you, you need to understand it in that context that we've taken some specific examples, such as a refund check going out that may have slipped through the process. But in general, we're, we're, we are processing and controlling the vast majority of the uh, of, of the uh, of the payments properly, as indicated by the uh, clean opinion in the uh, custodial statements. Let me pursue just the example of any of us as a human being. Our employer takes out the amount of money out of every paycheck for the Social Security Trust Fund and the Hospital Insurance Trust Funds. Now, when that comes in, let's say he's got five employees and half is matched by the employer under Social Security and Medicare and that money comes into an IRS center, what happens? Do they actually assign it to, quote, a trust fund? And if not, tell me where the reconciliation comes in. Is somebody just sort of keeping it like on a, a paper bag at lunch and say, gee, we owe that trust fund something at the end of the year? It is the When's reconciliation and love occur? I'll let uh, Mr. Dalrymple give you the answer to that. The service centers are under his direction. Okay. Well, you've been sworn in. been sworn in. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if I understood your question correctly, it, it is when do we actually certify the money's over? Uh, two years ago, we, I believe it was two years ago, it may have been three years ago, we got a recommendation from the GAO that we actually start uh, reconciling this to when it was paid as opposed to when it was reported because, as you know, there are times when this money is not paid over, and so then it goes into a collection activity and we, we end up collecting well, it. Well, let's make that very clear. When it is paid by whom? By the employer. Okay. When the employer's half comes in and the employee's half, they're really uh, coming in at different timetables, aren't they? Actually, they come in at the same time, but they're, uh, you know, they're, with, they're withheld. Hmm. As, as you know, this is withholding taxes, so they... But but we are now certifying twice. We're certifying what we what we expect is in the uh, on the books at the end of each quarter, and then we certify later when we verify that the payments have actually come in. So what was actually paid? Now this is whose books at this point? Is it on the employer's books or your books? On, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Well, the when the money is deducted in the paycheck, mm -hmm. the employer has it at that point. He's supposed to turn it in to the IRS. And he turns it in quarterly. And quarterly. And you get also the employee's half quarterly. Now, do those come in in one check or two? The employer it, it, sends one? They come in in one check. They come in at one time, one deposit by the employer. Yeah. Because the employer So the hold. full 15% or whatever right. it is exactly. is paid on Mr. Jones. Yes. And at that point, what do you do with it? Do you have something called a trust fund? The fact is you don't, do you? We don't have a... There is no trust fund. Right. Right? That's correct. Does that come as a surprise to anybody on Capitol Hill? What we want to do is, frankly, in this Congress, is make sure that every single dime comes into a trust fund and that the president can't borrow it no matter who the president is. And it's going to sit there and it's going to be a trust fund. So tell us how it works right now. Well, it comes in, <clears throat> we, uh, we make an estimate based on, on uh, the filings, the, the total amounts, and then later we go back and verify that through collections, and then that is what is certified, uh, as I understand it. And Mr. How Mr. You, Chairman, what, what no. he's speaking to is actually excise taxes, I believe. That's right. You're, you're speaking to the payroll tax. Right. Is that correct? That is correct. That, that is a different process. The IRS is now doing their certifications of excise taxes based on collections. However, for the Social Security, that is not what's being done. It's basically being done on IRS wage information. And so uh, let, me, let me defer to Mr. Sebastian to give you a little bit more detailed discussion of that, just to clarify the difference. Yeah, I'd just like two. to know how the system works, because I think it's an illusion in many cases. Yeah, as, uh, as Mr. Coots pointed out, um, what is actually happen happening with regard to the distribution of monies into the Social Security, hospital insurance, trust funds, those distributions are actually based on a certification of wage information that is done by the Commissioner of the Social Security Administration. Uh, there may be no relationship 
between what's certified and what's actually collected on, on a quarterly basis. And in fact, IRS systems currently don't capture uh, information as payments are being received that would allow you to actually affect a distribution to the specific trust funds. Uh, it, it's important to point out that the process of distributing into the Social Security and hospital insurance trust funds using wage information uh, versus actual collections uh, is actually in accordance with, with the law. Now, in is that what you would call an audit in the sense of the word? Can you trace them and get a, f a fix between the wage determination that is made and the actual payment that's made? Is there a gap there at all? Yes, yes. there is a gap, but we've reported well, that's my on point. that as part of and the so audit. What is, in which direction is the gap going? More money than they should collect or less money than they should collect? The way that it's working is the general fund is essentially subsidizing the Social Security Trust Fund because the IRS, as you can see up here and look at the write-offs, most of those write-offs are probably related to payroll taxes, as I recall. In fact, about $47 billion of the dollar amounts in there relate to yeah. payroll taxes. I mean, and so to the extent that those are not collected, yeah. the trust fund gets the money anyway. And we reported an estimate of about $38 billion this year that is a low end of the estimate of what the cumulative subsidy would be to the Social Security Trust Fund from the general fund. Well, it seems to me that you're talking about employers and employees paying in taxes at a certain time schedule, and it's going into one big pool of money. And hopefully you're depositing it fast so the Treasury can earn an interest on it and uh, save the taxpayers a little money. So what, what I'm trying to get at is what is certifiable, what is auditable, and what does the GAO think as to the time period for that audit? Is it simply an annual audit? And it seems to me there's an estimate made here. And on what basis is the estimate uh, made? It seems to me that uh, a lot of good people might have another way to do it. And I'm just curious how firm that estimate is. And is that simply a decision of the Secretary of the Treasury or what? as to what happens with the money when it comes in. Where's the bread? Where's the money? There's two separate audit issues here. The Social Security Trust Fund is an audit that we are not involved in. However, we have done some work for the Department of Labor and Transportation Inspectors General related to the amounts that get distributed to the Highway and Airport and Airway Trust Fund. And so we have done some procedures in that area. The Social Security audit is done by their Inspector General, and I think they contract with PricewaterhouseCoopers to do that audit. And so the actual audit of the Social Security information is done as part of that audit. But we do assist the Labor and Transportation Inspector Generals in auditing the certifications that Mr. Dalrymple talked about with respect to the highway and the airport and airway trust funds. Yeah, you know, let's take that since I sit on the Transportation Committee. You've got a highway trust fund, an airport improvement fund, and the fact is you don't get the exact amount that is going rung up on that gasoline pump, let's say, when somebody takes their car in to fill the tank. And uh, the company presumably is supposed to be keeping track of the federal tax and sending them a check, I assume, what, quarterly? What is it uh, in the case of yes. your friendly local oil company? And it goes in, maybe you should be telling us how it works. You're awful quiet on this. I think that's because maybe the emperor has no clothes or something. Uh, what can you tell us about uh, how the money's deposited into those funds? Presidents sit on them. The taxpayers pay them. Congress authorized that, but they also authorized the fund for a purpose, namely maintain the interstate highway system or ma maintain and expand the airport system in America. And yet we don't know how much is coming in accurately, do we? Or don't we? Well, don't all jump at it. You, you want us to answer that one? I want both of you to answer it. With respect to the excise taxes, we have done work for two years now, what is called agreed upon procedures work. And we did find problems with the IRS certification process in fiscal year 1997. In fiscal year 1998, as a result of recommendations by GAO, the IRS did make improvements in its certification process. And we found during this year's audit work 
that there were more accurate distributions to the highway and airport and airway trust fund. However, there are still some control problems that exist that IRS is working on our recommendations. Well, let me ask you, what is the current state of our tax on, let's say, airports, uh, the airport improvement fund or the highway trust fund? What's the tax that's levied in that area? I, I wouldn't have any idea exactly what, what it is in that particular area um, or any individual area, but just to, uh, to reiterate what Mr. Kutz has said. Well, uh, what I'm after is what's the methodology of saying, do you add up all the gallons of gasoline that have been sold, or how does one check? Back where the money is. Right, Mr. Chairman, I think it would be helpful if, if Mr. Sebastian walked you through the actual yeah. process here, because it's, it's fairly complicated, but yet he's done it many times. So let me give him a chance to, uh, right. to do that. He, he's a pro at this. I'm, I'm not a pro at it, and it is a, it is a complicated process. Let, let me start first by saying that um, as deposits, excise tax-related deposits are made, they are going directly into the, into the general revenue fund of the U.S. government. They are then being initially distributed to the various excise tax-related trust funds, such as highway and airport and airways. Those distributions are based on estimates done by the Office of Tax Analysis within the Department of the Treasury. And they essentially use much of the information that they use to derive the President's budget in making those initial distributions. What occurs roughly six months after a, a particular quarter ends is as the IRS receives the tax returns, excise tax returns, much of the information that you had mentioned, gallons of fuels, airport ticket tax, et cetera, is identifiable by the taxpayer on the tax returns. The IRS then matches, and this is rel a relatively new process this fiscal year, but the IRS matches the information on the returns to the amounts it has in its records with respect to what was collected by that taxpayer for that particular quarter. And bear in mind that up to this point, the IRS can't break, break the amounts that have been received down into the specific taxes. They have to wait for the tax return to come in. Uh, as a result of matching the information on the return to what was collected, the IRS then, then certifies the amounts that should have been deposited into the respective trust funds for that particular quarter. That information then goes over to the Department of Treasury's Financial Management Service, which compares the amounts the IRS is certifying for a given quarter against what was actually distributed based on OTA's initial estimation process. And Why don't you define OTAs? Oh, the Office of Tax Analysis? Right. It's a detailed estimation model. It, it looks into uh, uh, patterns of, of revenue streams. Do their uh, estimates ever come into a face of reality with the audit? And to what degree is there a difference? I, I would say that we, we've looked at the OTA estimation process from a standpoint of what controls they have in place to factor in uh, tax law changes, et cetera. We haven't done a detailed analysis getting into the adequacy of the underlying, underlying assumptions, but our sense is that the OTA estimation process presents reasonable estimates of the amounts that would be distributed. That doesn't mean, again, because there are estimates, they are subject to change, and that's a part of what the IRS subsequent certification process attempts to measure, is the degree of change between the estimate and the actual. But the root cause of this problem is when the money comes in the door, the taxpayer is not required to and does not break out the details of the different pieces for the fuel tax, et cetera. So IRS does not know at that point in time where the money should go. Because of that root cause problem, this elaborate process that Mr. Sebastian just described takes place at this point. It seems to me it ought to be very simple. How many gallons of gasoline did you sell at what price or whatever, and here's your share of the tax. Now, I take it that the individual gas station owner or franchise does not do that. The company, I take it, does the actual amount of the federal tax. Is that correct? Anybody you know? You mean the big, You're the big oil experts. companies? Yeah. Yes. Most of the returns coming in are from, from the example, major the oil, oil companies. And the chemical companies, et cetera, yes. Okay. And uh, is there a way that the uh, IRS has audited them to see if they're 
producing the right numbers off all of their stations. There's thousands of stations some of them have. Yeah. And they get a weekly report or almost daily on inventory. So, so you can tell, I remember working my way through college, you posted the report at 7 a.m. before you went off the sh 11 to 7 shift. And it was how many gallons had you come in on the shift? How many had you pumped out? So those data all are everywhere, I'm sure, and gas them, if you will. As part of uh, our large case examination program, and we, when we audit one of these large uh, companies, we have an excise team that's part of that, um, that examination. And they do just that. They literally go out and do some checks in some locales to determine whether or not there's any reason to go further uh, in terms of checking. And um, uh, then assess additional excise tax, if, if appropriate, or, or not, depending on how uh, the examination goes. What's the most difficult trust fund to deal with in terms of the estimates? I'm probably not qualified to answer it that question, Mr. Horn, but um, I suspect that someone from uh, Office of Tax Analysis would probably be the... Uh, well, we'll save a little spot in the record without objection to see Mr. what Chairman, the experts I, are going to do. I would say it would be the Highway Trust Fund. If you look at the, the, the form that comes in from the taxpayer, the Form 720, the Highway Trust Fund is made up of numerous different taxes, whether it be diesel fuel, uh, alcohol fuel, whatever the case may be, versus the airport and airway trust fund is only four actual taxes. So I think the answer to your question would be the highway would be the most complicated because it consists of the most different types of taxes. You want to pursue anything on this? Not on this. I have another one. Okay. Mr. Turner has some questions to ask. When we passed the IRS reform legislation last year, there was a lot of comment from the Internal Revenue Service uh, to the effect that making the agency more taxpayer friendly was going to make it harder to collect taxes rightfully due. And I would like to hear from each of you, uh, Ms. Cunningham or any of the other you brought with you, about your assessment of that claim at this point in time, because it's my hope that what the Congress did was make the IRS a more responsive agency to the taxpayer, but at the same time, I hope it did not keep your agency from collecting taxes rightfully due. And could you comment on that and whether or not you believe that uh, we are going to have some problems with collection, or can we overcome those problems and rightfully collect what is due. I'm not sure we have the total answer, but I do think John can address those issues as well. Actually, I think that the service's position was and is and, and will be on a, on a forward-going basis is that we actually believe that by putting our activities on the front end of the system, making ourselves much more uh, taxpayer-friendly, uh, in the sense that we are out in front trying to inform people about what their, their uh, uh, responsibilities are, actually impacts uh, compliance on the back end in a positive way. And that if we can get people to change their behaviors because we understand them better, because we're organized around uh, the way the taxpayers actually uh, uh, do their business, whether it's small business or wage and investment or exempt organizations or, or large and, and mid-sized businesses, I think what, what we anticipate now and in the future is that we'll much, be much better able to serve them and that we will reserve our enforcement resources for the most egregious cases and that we're actually helping more people to comply by uh, having more resources on the front end than on the back end. In fact, I think many of the people that end up uh, in, in, on the chart over there, if we could have gotten to much, much earlier in the process, would not be on the chart. Do I take it then that you're trying to reassure me that what the Congress did to make the agency more customer friendly is not going to have an adverse impact upon collections? 
Well, I, I think if there's any adverse effect, impact on uh, collections, specifically on collections, it'll whatever it will be will be short-lived and that over time uh, certainly the right thing to do is to help people comply with the tax laws as opposed to uh, waiting for them not to comply up front and then try to uh, use resources on the back end to try to get them back into compliance. That, that's just not a very smart way to do business. Uh, Mr. Cunningham, I, I was reading your statement um, again just a minute ago that you delivered to us earlier and you attempted to reassure us that you were going to uh, work diligently to address the concerns of the General Accounting Office, uh, that you were going to bring in some independent help. Uh, a, a comment was made by one of your colleagues that, you know, the commissioner is new. I, I guess I get the sense that even though the IRS is going through some reorganization, I, I don't sense that there's been a, a a real significant effort to deal with these financial management systems problems that we're talking about here today. And, and I guess first maybe I should ask you if, if the IRS is contracted out for the work to modernize its systems, uh, if it has or hasn't, uh, uh, and, and whether or not um, we're getting the kind of independent advice and the emphasis that's needed to overcome these problems rather than simply coming in here every year after an audit and having you know, someone in your position as the chief financial officer saying, yes, I'm going to respond to this. Uh, these problems seem to be running pretty deep. Uh, as we said, some of the systems have been in place since the 70s and before, and I just don't get the sense that there's been an emphasis internally at the IRS to really deal with this uh, seriously enough. Uh, could you comment on that, and perhaps then I'd ask the General Accounting Office to also respond? Uh, certainly, Mr. Turner. Uh, I think that we have put a great deal of attention on enhancing our systems, and certainly with the release of the prime contract that, that we made some a uh, few weeks ago, I think there is a big emphasis on a number of top priorities at the IRS, one of which is the financial systems. I would like Mr. Cosgrave to have an opportunity to be more specific about what those are and to assure you that the financial systems are in queue to be dealt with with the other systems uh, that are top priorities for the service. Very briefly. Uh, the. Uh overall plan that we've been executing against for the last two years since we presented the technology blueprint for modernization uh, was aimed primarily at the tax processing systems. Um, with the um, audit, GA audit from last year, uh, where there were some deficiencies pointed out in, in the way we uh, process data for the custodial accounts, we took some actions that have been going on now for a year to um, uh, in fact improve those custodial uh, systems in the way we provide data uh, to support that analysis up there. Um, with this report, we will now start additional efforts in terms of the administrative systems that, frankly, were not being addressed as, as forcefully as custodial systems. Now, I need to put all of that in the context that, first of all, we have hired outside expertise in the form of Computer Science Corporation and a partnership that they have put together, which includes IBM, Unisys, uh, among other players, uh, KPMG, uh, et cetera, to, to help us deal with all this issue. And in fact, they are the systems integrator that is driving the program going forward. So we've definitely reached out to the private sector for this assistance. Uh, however, we have made progress in these areas in terms of the, uh, the inventory uh, examples, for example, that were brought up earlier. Uh, we have had a problem that was recognized in terms of uh, particularly getting uh, um, assets that have been disposed of <coughs> through proper channels off our books. We've, we've been slow in terms of doing that. Um, and this presented some problem to us, particularly in, in terms of uh, confirming everything that we had for Y2K compliance. So over the last... Um, four months since the effective date of the audit, we have invested over $5 million in, in actually improving the basic inventory system uh, to address that one fundamental problem. So I suspect we will see some short-term improvements here the next time we have the inventory um, analyzed. Uh, however, I can't emphasize more, that, uh, once again, that these are very long-term problems in, 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 in their nature. They've been long-standing problems and we will continue to, to work on them. Um, the other point that was raised earlier in the, in the testimony was, was related to security. 
And I'd just like to point out there that um, uh, GAO had reported that uh, IRS had longstanding problems in the security area. Uh, but two years ago, we implemented our own system standards and evaluation office. This office is led by two SE executive, SES executives who are former GAO employees and over 60 employees. Um, and we've actually reported, and GAO reported in, in, their, in their audit, um, in fact, I can quote here that uh, they've acknowledged that 75% uh, of the improvements, 75% of the weaknesses that were identified in the April 99, 1997 report have, in fact, been mitigated. So we clearly are making progress. However, I can't uh, emphasize more the long-term nature of some of these, and beca particularly because of Y2K, you will not see a lot of immediate results in terms of the systems uh, changing, because clearly Y2K is our top priority at this time. Uh, I'd also ask uh, Mr. Kutz if you would respond to that. Again, what I'm looking for is your assessment of the degree of the commitment and the effort by the IRS to remedy these financial systems problems that you have identified. Yeah, I would concur with Mr. Cosgrave in that the focus of IRS over the last year or two has been on fixing the custodial systems. And I would also concur that that is a very long-term prospect. That is going to take numerous years. So we will be talking about these problems for the foreseeable future. Uh, I don't think there was as much emphasis placed on the administrative control issues with respect to the property and equipment, being able to produce things like an accounts payable listing at year end, or a listing in the budgetary accounts, for example, of your undelivered orders at year end. And I do believe IRS now recognizes the administrative related problems and is going to build a plan to try to fix those systems related problems. Thank you. Let me go back to debt collection for a minute. Uh, could you tell me, as Chief Financial Officer, Ms. Cunningham, the degree to which you tell the taxpayer that money is owed and how you do it and in what time period? How does that system work? And have you had a chance to look at it? I have had a chance to look at it, and we do have a system that works. But again, the expert on that is Mr. Dalrymple, if you would let me defer to him. Well, I would hope you would also know about this. I do, sir, but I, you know, am relatively new, and I don't know it to the extent of Mr. Dalrymple, who's been with the service for 23 years. Okay. How's the process work? Well, the process works uh, w once there's a, uh, a valid uh, debt, whether you filed your return and just didn't, uh, weren't able to pay it, or whether there was an examination of your return and and there was an amount uh, due or, or some other means. Uh, but once that happens, then an, a notice is generated. And it's a statutory notice of deficiency, and that's by law. And you receive a, a, a first in a series of notices saying, uh, would you uh, please pay the tax that uh, is, is here. When does the first notice go out after the taxpayer is it a 30-day thing once you notice a default? How does that work? Well, notice and default uh, refers to the examination process, but j just in general. Let's just take a, the normal taxpayer who files their tax okay. return on April the 15th. Uh, generally, those notices go out in June and July for uh, returns that were due to be filed on April the 15th. And we ask... Uh, uh, that the taxpayer uh, pay that account then within, um, I believe, within 30 days on the first notice. At the end of that period of time, we send a second notice and then a third notice. The second notice goes out when? 60 days roughly after roughly, April 15th? Uh, and actually, it's probably later than that because the first notice goes out about 60 days after okay. April 15th. So about 45 days after that, that first notice goes out, a second notice would occur. Now that's a written notice, It's right? a written notice. None then of this has been telephoned so far. No, nothing at telephone at this point in time. Then a third notice is generated to the taxpayer asking them to pay. At the end of this point in time, now there are certain types of of accounts that go directly to our, uh, our telephone contacts units. Uh, primarily, they would be trust fund accounts that were, were withholding has been made, and the employer didn't turn that withholding over. But just the general run-of-the-mill um, April the 15th filer, um, 
Now you're into a fourth notice. Finally, you'll, you'll get a final notice before any seizure or levy action. And that's actually what the notice says. Once that has uh, been out, then we send it to our telephone system uh, for a collection. And then telephone calls. Well, actually, then some sort of, uh, of uh, telephone call system is set up for uh, out calls and or to receive calls from the taxpayers depending on what action we may have taken, such as sending a levy out to uh, uh, an employer or a bank account. Did, do you ever use the telephone first? No, we haven't. And, uh, In other words, you don't say if this looks like a big taxpayer. That's right. Uh, our, actually, we do not. We treat everyone the same. I mean, that's one of the things that I believe is wrong with the system. When I talked about earlier how we need to get up front uh, I'm not just talking about up front with our, uh, our taxpayer education uh, criteria, but we need to move everything up front in, in the process. What we're going through now, um, and, and Mr. Rosati is, uh, uh, has, has done some of this uh, through his um, prior life uh, in, his, in his other company, is to go through a risk assessment for taxpayers to determine who who's not at risk at all, who will pay just through an installment agreement process, et cetera. Others who are at real risk and need telephone calls immediately or should be, uh, may, may even need a field contact immediately uh, as opposed to going through the notice routine. So our long, our long range view here is to do a, a total risk assessment of all of the accounts that we do and move that collection process uh, on a much, much more timely basis. Right now we basically treat all taxpayers the same way go through methodology. Now we do shortcut some of those systems on some basis of risk now, as I mentioned, trust fund, taxpayers, etc. But generally speaking, we do not have a very good risk assessment process right now for the general population. What about the uh, private collector? At what point do you involve private collectors to collect your debts? We don't uh, at all. You don't? No. Did you ever look at that? Yes, sir, we did. Yeah, and as I remember, you put out five-year-old debt for them to bid on, we, which I thought was one of the sillier things I'd seen in the American bureaucracy. That's bound to not be collectible. The question is, when you get in there early, and uh, I went through this with the previous commissioner, and that's what led to the Debt Collection Act of 96. I said it's a national scandal, as far as I'm concerned, when you've got $100 billion written off, and you have no process to really do it. None of your people were doing what they should have done, and you've put your finger on the risk assessment, certainly. And the fact is that because little Willie Jones that only owes you 30 bucks and somebody else owes you 30000 or has a loan from the Farmer's Home Administration, which was the example of uh, several million, and uh, they'd go and had given him another several million, even though he defaulted on the first several million, and so forth and so on. And uh, that sufficiently got my Irish dander up as to why are we letting them steal from the taxpayers of the United States. And I just don't understand it, and I still don't. I think uh, the world of Mr. Rosati, and I hope he will, you know, face up to this. I think he's got the common sense. Because when I said, why not turn it over to private collectors, to his predecessor, the answer was, oh, well, we have privacy laws. Baloney. You give them the amount, you give them the address, and say, go to it. If they've got a beef with IRS, fine, you use your people. But uh, we're losing billions of dollars. I don't know what GAO's thinking about it, but uh, I must say, when I see that thing keep going up, up, and up, and there's no, not too many SNLs going under now as an excuse to not collect it, and that's all I regard it as, is an excuse. And it seems to me uh, you had that experiment. I don't know who put that one together on the five-year debt to have private collectors bid on it, but uh, it just means you're passing it up. You're passing it up, and I don't understand it, why you can't use private collectors. Mr. Chairman, one thing I would say is those private collectors would be basically stuck with the same system that IRS is for collecting from taxpayers. So that would certainly hinder their efforts to go after some of these amounts. In other words, if the system doesn't properly identify who to go after, when the tax was incurred, et cetera, that would create some problems for private sector collectors. 
So a better system would also help well, what no would matter the, who goes after the What collection. would the General Accounting Office suggest as a rational system? I think that as part of their long-term tax system modernization plan, they're trying to put together uh, an appropriate sub-ledger similar to how you would have in the private sector that appropriately identifies the amounts due from taxpayers along with other detailed subsidiary information on those, inf on those individuals or corporations. And they do plan to do that as part of their tax system modernization. The problem is that is a very long-term effort. Well, uh, yeah, but uh, my heavens, we've been at this now for four years or, f yeah, four years of trying to get them to face up to how you run an organization. Now, I think Mr. Rosati has those credentials, so I've got great faith in him. But it seems to me you get people working for you. And uh, when you can't collect it now, and a private collector could collect it, I don't understand why somebody over in IRS doesn't say, hey, let's reorganize this operation. Are they afraid of the union or what? If not, get the union to go out and knock on the doors. But it has to be something that is delaying people from common sense and administration. Now, has anybody got a plan at that table in terms of the Treasury? Which, by the way, who is the chief financial officer of the Treasury? Uh, Nancy Gelfer, sir. Yeah. Is she full-time chief financial officer, uh, or is yes. she also assistant secretary? She's assistant secretary for management and chief financial officer, and she has spent considerable time with the whole IRS uh, modernization plan. You know, I don't see how you can when you're holding an 18-hour-a-day job also, which is the assistant secretary for management. But that's another story of why I think Treasury has been out of sync for a long time. Well, I'm not happy with the answers on debt collection, and it just seems to me you shouldn't let people off like that. And uh, if I were listening to this out there and I uh, was sort of worried about uh, do I know where my next payroll is, and that's where a lot of the problems come, somebody tries to not contribute on what the match is for Medicare and Social Security and all the rest. And then the problem here is you really don't know what's in those trust funds or what should be in. You're making estimates. Now, have we ever done an actual audit of this on a random? You do a random sample. Does IRS? Mr. Chairman, I, I don't. Could you rephrase the question? A random well, sample of what specifically? On the, the trust funds. I mean, I think we're pretty clear that you don't have a record that you can follow on the taxpayer that was had certain things deducted from their payroll and that the employer sent in a check to IRS. Nobody has an account down there. It's sort of almost like when you finally draw on it that somebody said, gee, we better get some more money in there. A lot of people are drawing this quarter. There's no relationship to what they deduct into relation to what you get. And uh, you can't seem to audit that either at the GAO level or the IRS level. That's correct. The IRS and the federal government do not know how much is collected for Social Security, individual, and hospital insurance taxes. Right. They must combine those for our financial statements or their financial statements. Is that basically your recommendation? Your recommendation is what to make sure that the money is there? We have recommended to them in the past to try to get the information from taxpayers up front so that that information can be. So the estimate process over at the Department of Treasury that Mr. Sebastian described would no longer be necessary. And they, they do have a study that they have performed that we have not seen the results of that uh, as soon as we begin our 1999 audit of IRS's financial statements, we will review the study. Mr. Turner, have any more questions? There is one. There is one item I wanted to briefly address. Uh, it seems to be something that would be manageable in the short term, and that's the problem that was raised in the audit uh, regarding uh, the hiring of individuals. And I assume this occurs a lot during peak seasons of employment at the IRS, hiring people with criminal records, and ways in which that could be uh, prevented. Uh, it seems like there ought to be a short term. A solution to that particular problem. Am I correct? Is there one, Mr. Cuts, and did you recommend one to the IRS? 
I think there is a reasonably short-term uh, fix to this with new machines that can provide online fingerprint checks with, and I, we saw one of these in Philadelphia actually, it's a machine that they can do an online uh, fingerprint check with the Philadelphia City Police and get a turnaround in maybe 24 to 48 hours. Uh, they don't have that capability yet with the FBI, but I believe that is part of the IRS short to longer term solution to this problem. I notice that you... Excuse me, Mr. Turner, if I might. We have worked with the FBI and we are currently, uh, we've just implemented the FBI electronic system to check those fingerprints in a more thorough and, and quick turnaround basis. And so that, you think that will remedy this particular problem in the short term? We are in the process, <coughs> excuse me, we are in the process of implementing that system currently and we will have results known in a little while. But yes, we think this is going to be a very big help in uh, checking very quickly whether these people have criminal records and not relying on a two or three week wait as we have done in the past. Thank you. Yeah. I think the problem in the past was not a two or three week wait. I think the problem was is that delays were much more significant. I think this solution would provide again a one or two day turnaround, which would mean that you're not going to have people going into the service centers and handling cash and checks and taxpayer data until you know that they don't have a derogatory background. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Coots, uh, the, uh, elaborate on the Anti-Deficiency Act, which you uh, mentioned, and the IRS's accounting procedures in relation to it, because criminal penalties are provided in the Act, but I don't think in the history of the country they've ever been invoked, or am I wrong on that? I don't know. You don't know? No. Or have you ever, do you ever remember a case? When of somebody violated the Anti-Deficiency Act, yeah. I do believe several years ago we did report at IRS that there was a violation of the Anti-Deficiency Act. I'm not thinking of just IRS. I'm I, thinking I, of the whole executive branch. Right, I can't speak okay. to that otherwise. Anybody got history on that within the Treasury? No. Usually they move money around so there isn't a deficiency such as it is. Uh, what, how does that relate, then, in the implications to the IRS accounting procedure? Well, Ms. Hawkins has been left out of this, so I want to give her a chance to answer this one here. So I will pass that to This is Delegation Day before yes, this I, committee, I, I can fair. see. Yes, glad to have you experts. Uh, I, I think, as um, uh, Mr. Coots mentioned, um, we disclaimed on the budgetary statement and part of the reasons for that is we could not get the data we needed to uh, to uh, verify a lot of those accounts like the undelivered orders on the suspense account uh, that had a net balance of disbursements um, of a hundred million dollars as of September 30th uh, 1998 that gave us concerns because basically those are amounts um, other agencies in the government uh, through a treasury system can basically take the money out of your fund balance with treasury if you owe money. Um, when you say expense account, what does that define? Um, is that per diem and travel? Is that what? No. If, for example, if um, um, for telecommunications, if GSA, the General Services Administration, is providing those services for you, uh, when they determine the amount that you owe for a particular uh, month, they will fill out through this OPAC system uh, information. And, and spell that one out, please, for um, we uninitiated non-bureaucrats. It's, it's basically a computer system. Um, and with the computerized electronic system, they automatically deduct money from your fund balance with Treasury account. The funds from your appropriation that you have with the Treasury, they transfer money to them. Uh, to cover expenses such as telecommunications or rent. Um, it's kind of like an electronic bill paying system. Mm -hmm. And it's done automatically. And we found in our sample of where we tested uh, expense um, amounts, we found several cases where items would go into the suspense account because the amount being uh, charged by the agency, such as uh, General Services Administration, was for more than what was obligated. 
uh, and in um, budgetary terms, you obligate money uh, to say we're reserving money from our appropriation to pay for what we expect to owe. And you can't pay money until you obligate. Uh, we found cases where items would go into suspense and the suspense account is not charged against any individual appropriation that is given to IRS. They have a suspense appropriation. And then when the obligation amount for a specific appropriation was increased, then the money would come out of suspense. When we look at the budgetary statements as of uh, September 30th, 1998, for the two major appropriations for um, IRS, the processing assistance and management had a uh, unobligated balances available of four million dollars, um, and the tax law enforcement had an amount of eight million dollars available. There was a hundred million dollars in the suspense account. Uh, we don't know whether or not all those amounts have been obligated, so we don't know whether or not. Um, there was a violation of Anti-Deficiency Act. In other words, Congress gives them an appropriation. The President recommends an appropriation. We discuss it. We pass, send back an omnibus appropriations bill or whatever it's called that year. And there is a target for IRS. And you're saying there's a separate account that uh, is there that isn't really where all the, all the money for administration of the tax system is not in a particular account, is what I'm listening to it. And if I'm wrong and listening to you, let's get it a little clearer. No, I, I think what you're saying there is correct. And, and so they can pay the bills out of the, well, I guess the old term was uh, using the float in terms of the interest that they accrue on other accounts. Uh, has any of that uh, been used by IRS to function as an agency when it wasn't appropriated by Congress, or what? What are you finding? We, um, because of the problems auditing this year, we didn't go into a lot of detail in this area. We did find cases, like in one um, uh, appropriation for fund balance with Treasury, a specific appropriation where there was a note saying, we don't have enough in this appropriation. We need to transfer money from another appropriation to cover uh, the needs that we have in this appropriation. And, um, and Congress has or has not given them the authority, known as reprogramming well, money from one to the other. In this particular case, uh, the dollar amount was low enough that I don't think they had to come to Congress for the reprogramming authority. Um, and um, again, in some of these cases, um, it's related to the... Um, the way the administrative activities are handled. Um, these two appropriations uh, were about six billion dollars and six billion million with a billion M. billion or with billion a with a B. Yeah, we Initially. we think only with B's around here, not M's. And yet, so. when when you look for these just these two appropriations, the amount as of September 30th remaining to cover things that hadn't been identified was 12 million dollars which seems quite small. We do know there's some, th some areas in some of these appropriations where they will be get it, collecting money that will increase those again. Um, but we just don't know whether or not um, their budgetary accounts are accurate or not. Well, and you're saying it's hard for you to get an answer uh, to them. Uh, was that because agency employees did not want to give you an answer? Or no, I, I would say agency employees uh, were very helpful to the extent that they could be. Um, some of the problems dealt with um, when we asked for a break out of the suspense account um, at the end of January, they didn't have a listing of what made up the suspense account, be so we couldn't go into details in terms of trying to find out what was in suspense and would it affect uh, whether or not they were uh, violating the Anti-Deficiency Act. Um, we couldn't, could not obtain a list of undelivered orders, which affects the budgetary accounts as of September 30th, 98 or 97, so we could not uh, say whether or not uh, what they had was correct. Um, so it was, some of it dealt with the systems and the way they are set up, and some of it dealt with the timeliness of being able to provide this computer information. 
Who sets the budget accounts for Treasury? Is it the Assistant Secretary for Management or the Chief Financial Officer? In this case, one person is holding both jobs. Is that what they have to wait for once a new fiscal year comes in? Or are these well-established accounts that I think they're well-established with some adjustment every year. Yeah. So is that what the problem is? In other words, they're using this suspense account, right? Uh, yes, they're using the suspense okay. account. Okay. And to what extent are they using the expense account? Or the suspense account, I'm sorry. This is before allocation suspense. to a budget category. Is that um, right? Right. Um, as of September 30th, 97, there was a balance of about over $100 million, and also there was a balance of over $100 million, uh, net as of uh, the end of September 30th, 98. How much the transactions are going in and going out during the year, I don't know. Well, it, it's okay unless it's criminal. So uh, did you detect any criminality in it or what? I, I didn't... I don't think there would be any criminality in terms of um, um, anyone purposely overspending appropriations. I think because of uh, some of the problems with the um, accounting systems and how they're used, that there is a potential that accidentally uh, something could happen. Right, but with a disclaimer of opinion, we're saying that because of the difficulties and the problems we had, we don't know. And we now, don't now, last year they did not, they had a very fine opinion, right? On the 97? Yes, they had an unqualified opinion on both admin yeah. and revenue. And you amazed all of us because back in 1993 94, when that law was put on the books, we said there's two agencies in this town that'll never meet it. One is IRS and the other is the Department of Defense. So we were only half right. And, uh, you know, you amazed us, so congratulations. And I wonder why this year seems to be so different than last year when GAO goes in to audit things. Well, decision to direct our attention to 94, when that law was put on the books, we said there's two agencies in this town that'll never meet it. One is IRS and the other is the Department of Defense. So we were only half right. And, uh, you know, you amazed us, so congratulations. And I wonder why this year seems to be so different than last year when GAO goes in to audit things. Mr. Chairman, if I might explain a little bit on that. First of all, I'd like to say that we do have full confidence that we are appropriately obligating and expending our appropriated funds. The part of the difficulty that we've had this year with the administrative audit is we did not set our own timetables uh, to coincide appropriately with GAO's timetable. Our accounts are extremely laborious to audit. The number of transactions because of the volume of business that we do makes it very, very time consuming to take each individual major account and uh, provide a sufficient audit trail so that it can be uh, fully audited by the GAO auditors. What we did do is we tried to do that we had the new statements that called for new accounts to be audited that had not been audited previously. We feel that had we had, had we not run out of time and made the conscious decision to direct our attention to 99, that we could have proven those numbers uh, to a much greater extent. We just frankly ran out of time and that's I think the reason why they have the disclaimer. We do feel that we are appropriately handling our appropriated funds. Well, is this a, does this mean you have to have a new allocation of where you place people in the department and in IRS or what? what what's your solution as chief financial officer to get some of these problems done? Is it more training that's needed or oh, what? Are you talking about to get a clean audit? Yeah. Yes. Uh, again, this is what we're talking about, that we have a multi-dimensional project team working currently to determine exactly what we need to do. We know we cannot quickly bridge the long-term solutions that are required for our financial systems, but we can do more manual preparation in a more timely fashion. We're getting started much earlier this year, so when GAO comes in, we can provide them with auditable types of uh, account analyses. We've talked to our contractor who provides us that accounting help and they are making some changes and accumulating data a little bit differently for us. It is auditable, it's just very time consuming to get it audited.
Yeah, I think in addition, that was one of the conscious decisions we made because uh, starting on the 99 action plan, uh, what that really means is proving the 98 balances. So even though that wasn't con done in conjunction with the audit, that'll be the first thing to make sure that the opening balances for 99 were correct. So we'll be, we'll be working on that uh, as well. Any other comments either side might have about the testimony you've listened to? What are we missing? Well, there'll be a number of questions sent to both the General Accounting Office, IRS, and the Treasury that we haven't been able to get to, but uh, we'd appreciate any response you could give us on that. We've held a few things open for different exhibits, as you've noted. Uh, let me just, before I make a few closing remarks, uh, let me th first thank the people that set up this hearing, and we appreciate you coming up here on such short notice. We know that isn't easy, and uh, we're sorry to disrupt your weekend that way. Uh, J. Russell George, our staff director, chief counsel, is uh, behind me, and uh, Bonnie Heal, director of information, is also there. Uh, Matthew Ebert, policy advisor, uh, there and uh, Larry Malenich of the General Accounting Office. We appreciate uh, that loan. It's very helpful to us. And Mason Allinger is the clerk. And uh, then we have three able interns, Paul Wicker, Casey Baker, Richard Lucas. And for the professional staff uh, for the minority, Faith Weiss and uh, Early Green, a staff assistant, are very helpful on this, and uh, knowing the complexity of this, we had three court reporters this morning, and uh, Ryan Jackson, Cindy Zebo, and Doreen Dotzler, uh, and we thank them. Now, let me just make a few comments. Uh, today's testimony displays that there has been some financial waste by the department and IRS, and that taxpayers too often believe that all agencies in the federal government uh, have that. I don't happen to agree with that, but I think we need processes and systems to make sure. And some of them are just very simple, such as the segregation of duties when you get into accounting. I've learned a lot from auditors over the years, and uh, you force people to take their vacations and somebody else sit at their desk, and you be amazed to see what happens sometimes when they say, what's this uh, authorization all about? And uh, Apparently 17 million, was it, in fraudulent refunds and uh, misplaced vehicles, computers, printers, and uh, th that needs to get more attention than just thinking it's an accounting procedure, because that wouldn't really be acceptable in most small businesses or medium businesses. And you're a very large business with IRS having 102,000 employees alone. I believe that's the figure, is it not, about now? and. Uh, I think the stockholders, the taxpayers, have every reason to demand a dramatic and immediate change, and that includes debt collection. Uh, when we see that figure over there, that uh, the write-offs at 110 billion, and that's 54 percent of the unpaid uh, debts that are owed. And just think, we talk about a surplus. We talk about helping Social Security. It'd be great to try to collect even just 10 percent of that or 15 percent. We ought to set our goals higher. So uh, I think uh, there's a lot of work to be done, and uh, I'm hopeful, and it sounds like you're getting this up to speed, and I would hope that next year we will have a clean opinion and that the processes on uh, handling property and equipment uh, in particular will be improved and uh, the security force you have there at your field offices and processing centers, uh, there ought to be ways to uh, where they can check that uh, printers and personal computers are not just walking out the door. Or if they are, there's an authorization there where you've got a name of a checkout and you check it in. Very simple little procedure. Does my colleague have any more questions he'd like to ask? And. Uh, if not, we'll wrap it up, but go ahead. Uh, no questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I simply want to say, uh, as the Chairman did, that obviously there's work to be done. But on the other hand, I, I want to say here today, as I listen to some of the witnesses, that oftentimes we fail to acknowledge the contributions that the career employees of agencies like the IRS make. 
to the people of this country. And for those of you who are career employees of the Treasury and of the IRS, uh, we owe you a debt of gratitude because you work in a very complex area with very difficult problems. And uh, many times I think if we can provide the political leadership needed, uh, you have the background, the knowledge, and the dedication that's necessary to get the job done. So to all those career IRS employees, some of whom were in my office just a couple of weeks ago from my district in Texas, uh, I thank you for the work that you do. It's well said. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for coming. This hearing is adjourned. Here's a look at what's ahead. Next, a ceremony to commemorate those who died in the Persian Gulf War. At 1 p.m., Social Security reform is the subject of a